together, but initially Mrs. Shanley will be talking about her early childhood, and then Mr. Shanley will be speaking about his family background, and then we will come back together and talk about their experiences, which converged at one point. Mrs. Shanley, why don't you begin? No, I don't know where to begin. Uh, I was born in 1924 and in, a, in Lemberg, Lemberg or Lvov. They, they're both names uh, interchangeable on the map. It was a city of 350,000 people, out of which there was a very uh, large Jewish population. I don't know how much, I don't know what really. Uh, the cultural life in Lemberg was a rich one. Uh, there were many, in spite of the uh, general feeling that everyone who came from Eastern Europe came from an impoverished area, Lvov was a flourishing city with a lot of rich merchants. And my father was a builder, and I had one sister, Miriam. And we grew up in a very comfortable setting. My parents put the greatest emphasis on education. They sent me to the best gymnasium. It was not a state gymnasium because being Jewish, I did not qualify for a state high school or gymnasium. It had to be a private one, which was an excellent one. They sent me to a conservatorium. I was an accomplished violinist. And life was pretty nice for me. We didn't realize, really. I didn't. I was too young. I was 15 when uh, the war broke out. I did not realize what's going on around me. Being in a Polish school, I was infused with the <coughs> spirit of patriotism towards the Polish state and Poland and so on. Uh, by the age of 13, 14, I began to see signs of anti-Semitism, parks where there were signs, Jews and dogs are not permitted to go in. Um, during certain holidays, we knew not to go out because the, uh, the uh, um, students would riot and sometimes accost the Jewish people. But it was a very mild version of what happened later. Now you just have disregarded it and you went on with your life. This was still 1939. In 1939, Poland was divided according to the pact between uh, Hitler and Stalin into two separate parts. The eastern part was invaded by Russia. The western part was invaded by Germany. Now, we are in the eastern part of Poland, therefore we were under the occupation of the Russian regime between 1939 and 1941, at which time life changed drastically. We still stayed in our home. We had a beautiful home, but we were allocated only one room in our own house. The rest of the rooms were occupied by Russian officers, whatever. The schools had changed only to the extent where they added the uh, Russian language as one of the prerequisites of going to, to the gymnasium. Uh, well, I'm not going to talk about the shortages of food and so on, but when you're very young and you're involved with studying and you have your friends, you don't pay so much attention to those necessities of life. A lot of people were taken at that time to Siberia they issued what they called number 11. Number 11 meant that you were a capitalist and therefore you or your family was transferred out of the city. We had gotten also the number 11 uh, in our home, but due to the intervention of some of the workers who worked for my father, who happened to be a very liberal man, we stayed in Lemberg. Perhaps it was the wrong choice. Perhaps my family would have lived had we gone to Russia, to Russia. This was between 39, 1939, 1941. In 1941, Germany occupied the rest of Poland, and this is when hell broke loose. Uh, 
member. Which point did you meet Mr. Shannon? Well, um, First we, stayed in a, first, we stayed really in our own home for about a month. As I said, it was in the best section of the city. After about a month, the Gestapo chose as Gestapo quarters our home and sent us out. At that time, they still didn't have a ghetto in, in Lemberg. They had what they called a separate part of the city designated for Jews. So all the Jews had to congregate and live there, and we got one room. However, the uh, Germans who occupied my apartment, I was at that time already 17 and rather attractive, told me that I have to stay on and become their uh, house uh, keeper, cleaner, whatever, what have you. I stayed there during the day. I cleaned house. I cooked for them the best way I knew how. And at night, I went back to the Jewish part of the city. This went on for about two, three weeks without them making any advances to me. But one day, I was rather naive, one day one of the officers said that he would like to take a bath and would I wash his back? And I said, naturally, no. And we left it at that. When I came home that night and I told my father about it, he said, you can't go back. He saw what's coming. I didn't go back there, and the next, next day, the two Gestapo men were knocking on our door. My father came out and said that I'm very ill, and I'm in the other room. I guess I was lucky they didn't pursue it any longer. I didn't go back to my own home to serve them, and we stayed in that part of the city. This was for about two, three months, I guess, after which they started enclosing a closed ghetto. We moved again. This time, two families in one room. And we stayed there for several months. At that time, they started the actions. Now, I don't know if anyone knows what an action is. An action is an organized attempt to gather, round up Jews, throw them into trucks, put them in certain places where they had to congregate, wait for the trains, and take them out. They used to drive up in front of the buildings with sirens blazing, guns drawn, run up, run up and down the steps, and look and round up the people they could on the streets and in homes. We saw that it's getting to be very dangerous to be in that Lemberg ghetto. My father and my mother both come from a little town on the Russian-Polish border, and they felt that it's easier to survive in a smaller town. It's easier to get food, because in the Lemberg ghetto, at that time, we had no food anymore. So they rented a truck, they, and with me and my little sister, we went by truck at night to that little town, because it was for them like coming home. They came from that little town. That little town called Scala is the town where my husband was. And this is where I met him in 1941, was it? Three. No, no, not three. No, no. 1941. Yes. At the end, the I end. think, of 1941, I met him there. He's a dentist. He still had his uh, dental office, and he uh, took care of the population there, and I met them there. Did your, fam did your parents have any family still in, in Skala? Yes, when we went to Skala, I still had my grandmother, my grandfather. My, my mother also had her both parents. Mm -hmm. So we had two sets of grandparents when I went back to that little, very good question. Mm -hmm. When I went back to that little town, aunts, uncles, mm -hmm. my uh, mother had uh, one, two, three, three or four sisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Living in Scala, uh, my father had a sister. Mm -hmm. And what was life like in that town at that point? Um, in the little yeah. Scala? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for me, I was a big city girl. It was unbearable anyway, but under those circumstances, it made no difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a survival for food every day. Mm -hmm. But when we got there, they still didn't have any actions. Mm -hmm. The actions didn't start yet. 
I wish I could remember exactly Was what your father month. able to find any work? How were you able to, or oh, did the family support No, you cannot you? work. Mm -hmm. There was no work. The family did not support us. We did not have money because my father was a builder. He was in real estate. There was no money. I don't know till today how we survived. It was just selling your, your belongings and selling a fur coat and selling a ring and going on from day to day. And shortly after we arrived, my father was uh, uh, caught in Scala and was taken to a concentration camp. Only my father. Mm -hmm. I stayed with my mother and my sister. Mm -hmm. At that time, it became a little bit more dangerous to walk the streets. I remember one incident when I walked with some friends and a German soldier saw me and he pursued me to the house and at night he came in with two other soldiers, you remember? Yeah, I was in Warsaw. Yes, and he really uh, had some uh, intentions and he was sitting and he was sort of not playing with me but touching me, whatever he felt like touching me and saying that he would like me to go with him to a different room and I said I don't and at that time he came with another German soldier, an Austrian. That Austrian looked at me and I looked so pleadingly at him, I was only 17, and I said, please, take him away. His name was Gottschalk, the one who was pursuing me. I said, I don't know what he wants from me. So since he was very drunk, the Austrian German took the German German away from me and they disappeared. But from that time on, I didn't show my face on the street too much. And if I did, I had a very a kerchief up to here, so my face didn't show. Um, it was very difficult, and we were just waiting. At that time, they already formed the Judenrat in Scala. My family did not participate in it. My husband didn't, my father didn't. Well, my father wasn't there anymore. He didn't believe in it. I, till today, I don't know whether the function of the Judenrat was survival of Judenrat, the survival of the rest of the people. They Juden, had to make Judenrat, choices. Judenrat was a council they know of what uh, Jewish, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. They had to make constant choices, and the choices were very cruel. Mm -hmm. When the demand came for 10 people or 15 people to send out to a concentration camp, they had to select them. And they knew if they're not going to select other people, they will have to select from their own relatives or friends and so on. So those moral choices were so horrific that uh, we didn't want to have any part of the whole thing. Uh, my husband still had a uh, dental office and he treated actually German soldiers as well. And while treating German soldiers, he became he wasn't friendly with, but the, the what was he, a commandant? What, what would it be? The Herr. Herr. Yes. He was in charge of uh, the... Uh, of the Jews. No, well, he was in charge of all the Germans in that little town. I don't know what his rank was. He was not a mayor. No, major. no, no. The major was the... Above uh, him. Above him. So he came very often to Joseph and had his uh, teeth treated. And it wasn't a friendship, you can be friendly with a German, but there was sort of a rapport where he could sometimes talk to him. Or if somebody would be beaten up badly in the little city, they would come to Joseph and say, please talk to Hera, and he comes with his teeth, tell him to stop, and he would do it. And sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Except at one time something happened, you can tell. What happened? Yeah, well, what happened then is it was uh, one uh, Jew, uh, certain Mr. Hashivis, was beaten up there. And, and this Commandant Hera promised that he would get at him. So he came to me and he asked me to talk to him, so I talked to him. and. Uh, he uh, uh, asked for a $20 gold piece 
you know, to give him, to let him alone. So he, he got a $20 piece, he gave it to me and I gave it to him. Of course, nobody should have known about it, but somehow, I don't know, it leaked out. And uh, when he was at a social evening there with other Germans, one German told him about the 20, that he knows about the $20 gold piece. Then he, as friendly as he was with me, he came over one night about uh, after midnight, knocked in the window, and he told me to come with him. They had, this was a chapel uh, of, uh, a cemetery, no, wasn't it? No, there was no cemetery. Or whatever it was. It was yeah, maybe. it was the chapel and there were some tombs there, you know. And this was his execution place. That's where he executed one man we were looking at him through the window, how he executed him. And he calls me there. So I went with him. He didn't talk, he didn't speak a word to me. He just showed me where to go. And I saw that he is leading me there to that uh, chapel and I knew what, what's going to happen there. So I stopped and I asked him, what is it? What is it that bothers you? So he told me, uh, you must have told to somebody, you know, about this $20 gold piece, you know, and I was ashamed now, you know, in, uh, in that social evening. And uh, he was furious. He wanted to shoot me there and uh, finish with me, just for that, uh, I, I really didn't tell him, and I swore to him that I didn't tell anybody. And how it leaked out, I didn't have the faintest idea. So he let me go home. But he woke up that Junrat and the whole business, and the next day he had to go uh, on vacation to Germany. So he gave there an order. Uh, diamond rings and he was this for his wife, gifts and this and that. By tomorrow it should be done. So, of course, they, they did. Everybody uh, took off his jewelry and he gave it uh, for his wife, you know. He took it. And he left the $20 gold piece with me until he would come back. He came back, I, I was glad to get rid of it. Yeah, he says he doesn't want to have it with him. Yeah. Well. And, uh, well, it, it, it was, it was some ordeal there. Do you want to, um, at this point, um, backtrack and yeah, uh, let him talk for five with, minutes yeah. about yeah. himself? I'll okay. be like, man. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be right back. See, it so happened that uh, I was the only dentist in the town there. Mm -hmm. There were no Gentile dentists, you know, so they needed me. So even then, then when there was an action, you know, when they accumulated, I, I don't know, they caught up with about uh, uh, 300 people. The older people they shot in the in the apartment, in the bed, wherever they were. And uh, and uh, me, they they kept there, mm -hmm. you know, because they needed me. Mm -hmm. They were coming to me as my patients, you know. And my wife was working with me then as my dental assistant. Anything. As long as she was of some help, they they didn't she was protected. they didn't catch her, you know, to the uh, women's camp, you know, uh, and somehow we survived there. Then, Mr. Um, Shemley, you want to backtrack a little bit and tell us about your early your childhood, your childhood. and your family? Uh, my childhood was eventless. You know, I grew up before the war. There was no war then at the time. What, what year were you born? 
Uh, I was born in Korolovka. This is also a small uh, town there, about 30 miles, uh, 25 miles away from Skala. In what year? Pardon? In what year? Oh, 1910. Mm -hmm. I am, as you see, three quarters of a century old. And uh, then I got my education, you know, and uh, when I became a dentist, I settled down in Skala. And I Your had... Your family remained in the other town? My family, no, was with my... I had only... I was the only child, you know, so my mother was with me. And then when it came... Uh, when the Germans came in, of course, I sent away her father, my wife's father, her sister, and my mother. I sent away to one of my patients who swore to me that when he came in once, you know, to me with a terrible toothache, you know, he was rolling on the floor from pain. And I quieted down for him, so he promised me that any time, you know, I need to be, uh, uh, if I need a place to hide, you know, he will keep me. So I sent away there my mother, her father, and uh, her sister to that place over there. We still stayed over there. And, and this was in Borsov already. Also, there was a ghetto, but I was allowed to have my office, my dental office, outside the ghetto because the Germans didn't want to come into the ghetto, you know, and I was again the only dentist. Bring us from Skala to Borshov. Uh, it was 14 uh, kilometers, which is, uh, is about 10 miles, uh, how, 9 miles. What, how did you decide to move from Skala to, to the oh, Austrian no. Because when the first action happened, this was on September the 22nd of 1942, they rounded up as many, uh, they rounded up as many people as they could. As I told you before, what they shot, they shot right away in their home, and, and then they wanted to concentrate the Jews in one place. So from Borshov, Korolovka, uh, Azirani, the several uh, townships around there, they all concentrated in Borshov. They told us to go there. We are not allowed to live here anymore. And there I was uh, also treating the Germans. And uh, one day a German officer came in, a patient of mine, and uh, he told me, run for your life, because he knew that they are preparing now for the liquidation of the Jews in that town. And I asked him when. He said yesterday, that fast. So we called up that patient of mine, you know, there, and uh, he sent a horse and buggy, you know, and we went over there too. And really the next day or two days later, you know, they liquidated whatever Jews they were left in Borshov, you know, they liquidated them. What year was that? And uh, all of 1940, 1943 already. That was already in 43. Yeah, it was in 43. A lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't. Uh, no. Possibly. Now, I will go back a little bit before the Germans came in to the town of Scala. Mm -hmm. There, the uh, Hungarian soldiers, which were associated with the Germans. They came in first, and on our, in our backyard, was a tremendous backyard over there, there came in about uh, 200 soldiers with their, uh, it was a uh, lieutenant who was their head, you know, and that lieutenant sent our patients to me, Hungarian patients. I treated them whatever was necessary, and I never asked them for money, because I knew they are going to Russia now, and I never asked them for money. 
So that lieutenant, this was a, which was a very friendly man, and uh, used to come into my home, and my mother used to uh, give him coffee and cookies and whatever, but we were very friendly. He told me, you can never tell, maybe someday you will wind up in Hungary. And he gave me a, a certificate whereby he says that he certifies, of course with his uh, stamp, you know, the 103rd command or whatever it was, that he certifies that uh, uh, that I, as a dentist, gave them help whenever they needed to the soldiers, and I didn't want to take any money from them, and therefore he is asking to give us any, to give me any support possible whenever I need it. And he gave me this piece of paper. I put it away. I figured, where am I? Where is Hungary? You know, uh, it, you couldn't go from one town to the other let alone uh, to Hungary. To Hungary. Mm -hmm. Did we talk at all about life in the ghetto and the bunkers? No. Well, the could bunker. You, could you yeah, describe I'd it? like to. Mm -hmm. See, each house was like an armed fortress without arms. Each house had at least three bunkers. Now, in my grandfather's home, there was a bunker, one bunker under the uh, stove. The bottom of the stove would pull out, and we would, we would crawl down, and then pull the bottom in. That was one bunker. There was a bunker in the uh, attic, where there was usually a concealed part of a wall, which would open, and then once you were in, it would close in. The whole thing naturally had to blend in. If it was the, wall, uh, the floor, it would blend in with the design of the parquet. If it was the wall, it had to blend in with whatever, the paint or wallpaper. There was no wall, wallpaper in that little town. But it had to blend in somehow. Now, every time we heard that an action is coming, these bunkers were usually had, uh, we didn't have food. Usually we used to put there a few cubes of sugar, because sugar can sustain you for a day or two, water. There were some babies, naturally, baby food, which they didn't have anyway. And any time we felt or we knew of somebody who worked for the Judenrat, I feel that's the only function of the Judenrat which I found helpful, that the young boys who worked with the Judenrat sometimes knew ahead of time when something is coming. And if they did know, they would immediately tell the city, the town, and the town would simply disappear. And we would either start, go into the bunkers underneath, or into the walls, or into the attics. We would completely disappear. Now, when the Germans would come in, they always had dogs with them, German shepherds. And they, had, they let them loose, and the dogs would sniff, sniff for human flesh. The other uh, device they used were very big sticks. Now, why do they need the sticks? They used to bang on the floor and bang on the walls. If you have an opening in a wall, that sound will be hollow. If you don't have the opening, the sound is different. They used to bang on the floors inch by inch to see if they can hit a hollow sound, meaning the Jews are hiding there. Those were the conditions under which we sat there, sometimes a day, and sometimes two, and sometimes three, without food, without any communication with the outside world, with dogs howling on top of you, <coughs> shots, screaming of Jews who were caught, screaming of children dying, and we were just sitting. And this happened many times in Borstro. The last time, I didn't have time to run into a bunker, and I ran out into the street. But within five minutes, the street was completely dead. It was completely empty. It was 12 o'clock noon, and on one side of the street was that emptiness and that deadly silence, and all you could hear is 
closing of the bunkers, wherever you stood, you could hear it. On the other side were the Ukrainians and the Poles going to church. It was Sunday, and the bells were ringing, and I looked around, and I didn't know what has happened to the whole world. The whole world went crazy. And I wanted to cross the street, naturally, and blend in with the crowd going to church. And one of the uh, 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 policemen, not German, we had not only German police, we had the Ukrainian police helping the German police round up the Jews. The Ukrainian policeman, a tall young guy, saw me trying to cross to the other side. And I guess he felt pity on me. He didn't let me cross, but he didn't shoot me. He said in Polish, go back. Back where? Back into the ghetto, which is empty and deadly silent, and there's no place to go. And I was leaning against a fence and thinking, this is it, another minute. And as I'm leaning against the fence, I hear behind me a noise of something closing. I said, this is it. Somebody has a bunker there. I can fit in there. I said, let me in. They said, who are you? I said, I'm Leon Gottesfeld's daughter. Let me in. And in a second, they opened a toilet. They let me in. They shut it closed. I sat there for two and a half days on one cube of sugar. Then what happened again with the Judenrat is as soon as the Germans would leave, the young assistant from the Judenrat would run around and tell passed the word, and people started crawling out of the woodwork again. At that time, but every time there was less people going out of the woodwork. At that time, I thought that the, she is dead, because they rounded up 800 Jews then. And uh, Oh, yes. Those Jews went straight to the cemetery. They were told to undress at that time when I wasn't caught. They were told to undress women, children, and dig and their graves. They did the yeah. evil deed. They threw him in. They covered the grounds. 800. About, about two months later, because the, the blood. graves were so shallow, the blood started exploding fermenting. and fermenting and shooting up into the air. Yeah. yeah, at that time I thought she was dead because I heard in the morning only uh, I was in my office you know, that day, and I slept over the night there in my office, and I, uh, the owner of that uh, house came and told me that they rounded up 800 uh, Jews uh, to the cemetery. A big common grave was dug before they came there to the cemetery, and everyone that undressed went to the edge of the grave, you know, and was shot in the head, you know, and uh, fell to the grave. And uh, every shot meant to me, you know, that this is her. You know, I didn't know that. I thought she was dead. And then about uh, 2 o'clock, I think it was in the afternoon, I saw all of a sudden I look out the window and she is coming, you know. After that action, they started declaring Juden Rhein. Do you all know what Juden Rhein means? That Juden means Rhein means the place is officially clean. Rhein means clean. Clean out of Jews. It's cleaned of Jews. You don't exist anymore in any capacity. You're not supposed to exist. Because if the place is declared Juden Rhein, you're not there. And if you are there, you, anybody who sees you has the right to shoot you down like a dog on the street because you do not exist anymore. It was at that time that we decided to hide with some peasants in a nearby town. No. What about the rest of your family right. at that point? Well, in Scala, going back, before we had the resettlement, there was one of very severe actions, very long one, and my parents and my sister were rounded up and taken to a common place where they had to wait for the trains to take them away. My sister, somehow, with the help of my father, was able to escape. She knew when, where I am hiding with him in a different, in a different uh, bunker. And during that night, in the darkness, she ran all away from the place where she was to the house where we were hiding, 
and she knocked on the floor and she told us who she is and we let her in. And I had my little sister with me for a while. Yeah, then... Uh... My parents were taken away. My mother was 48 and my father was 48. My mother had a weak heart and I never heard from her again. My father was a healthy man and he was taken away to Lemberg to a camp. And after a month or two, we started getting letters from him. And what happened, Joseph, my husband, who had a lot of connections still with the German uh, patients, was able to pay whatever we had, we paid, and a German sent a truck to the Lemberg concentration camp and stole my father out and brought him back. So we were a little bit, we, we had my sister was with, was with us and my father was with us. But as uh, going back to that last action, after that in Judenrein, it was just a question where to go. You couldn't stay in a bunker, you couldn't eat in a bunker. So my husband and I went with uh, some peasants to a neighboring town and stayed there for a while it became too dangerous. My father and, and my sister went to a different peasant and were hiding there. They were hiding a whole year. They were caught and executed a week before liberation. liberation. Now, uh, we decided then, we heard from uh, the Hungarian soldiers that in Hungary, the Germans were not officially there. They didn't occupy Hungary yet. So that there, I think uh, life goes on. You know, Jews go there to the uh, temple and they, they pray and they go on the streets, just like... But this was 1943. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I reminded myself, you know, of that piece of paper that I got from that uh, lieutenant and I figured, let's try it. And that peasant where we stayed, that patient of mine that we stayed in, uh, we sent him out to the border of the Polish-Hungarian border. He should arrange there for us to be taken over across the border to Hungary. He arranged everything beautifully, you know, we paid him whatever we still had left, you know, and he arranged for everything. And uh, before we left there, I bought a uh, handgun, an automatic handgun. There were six bullets, you know, in, uh, in there, in the, the seventh in the barrel, you know, and I figured, I told her, remember one thing, you know, when it, when we, uh, see some Gestapo or SS, whoever, and they don't like our face, before they have to kill us, you know, I will kill two, three, four of them, I will save the last bullet for myself. But you, I say, you run, because it was a wooded area, run to the woods, and then somehow, if I survive, I will find you. If not, uh, I can't help it. And we came to the uh, Hungarian border, you know, it, our luck, we really were very lucky because over there at the Hungarian border there was a Gestapo post. They had German shepherds especially trained for this purpose. They knew the Jews are running from Poland to Hungary. They had them specially trained that when you put on a band, you know, on a, on a man. He could, he could have been a, a Gentile, but once he sees that thing, you know, he would tear you apart alive, you know. Just tear you apart. They didn't have to shoot him even. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and we pay, and it was raining, it was a stormy rain, you know, something awful. And we passed by that post somehow, you know, and, and our peasant that took care of the arrangement, you know, had arranged another uh, horse and buggy, you know, the ones that are in the mountains, they, have, they had the, the small horses and especially small uh, uh, wagons, you know. And he told us to go over there and we went to, uh, to a peasant there, to his home. There he gave us something to eat, you know, and he says, go, I don't want to keep you here longer. And we started going in that rain. <laughs> it was awful, you know. Up the hill, the carpet hills, you know, it was like, like a wall climbing there. Maybe about two miles or three miles to another peasant over there. There we had to take off our clothes and dry him out, you know, and the following night we went through the border. The whole night we walked, you know, until we got through the border. <coughs> Once there in the border, you know, uh, I'm there. Uh, you know, we were caught over there, and uh, we, we were caught by the Hungarians. It was uh, uh, the man that took us over from the Hungarian side. We gave him five dollars then at the time. It was a lot of money then at the time. We gave him five American dollars. He should go and get us something to eat. Instead, he took the five dollars, he never came back. And uh, that woman, the owner of the house, wanted to get rid of us because she was afraid of the uh, soldiers. So uh, she waited until night, and then she took us out and said, come, I'll take you where you want to go. And sure enough, in the darkness of the night, you know, she took us towards the border, back, so we can get caught there by, by the Hungarians. And uh, I have a good uh, sense of orientation, you know. I knew which way the, she's taken us. And she disappeared among the trees, you know. She disappeared and went back home and left us in the woods. I told her, let's go back. We came back there. We knocked the door and she says, you stop knocking on my door, we don't want you here, and uh, this and that. She had a brother living next door. We went into him. And he was afraid too. So he was friendly. He let us in, he gave us something to eat. She slept there for an hour or so. But he went over to, to uh, the border, uh, where the soldiers are there, and he told them, look, I have here a couple of people. They came over from the other side. What should I do with them? He says, all right, you show them the directions where to go and tell them to cross that little bridge. I will be standing on the bridge there, and then I'll take them over. No, he showed us the directions. Sure enough, we went there. And I said to my wife, I don't know, I have a bad premonition that we are going to be caught, you know. And and the, the gun that I still had with me, you know, a loaded gun, you come to, uh, to another country during the war with a loaded gun, with ammunition, they hang you. There is uh, no doubt about it. So I told them, I have to get rid of that gun. So naive as we were, we put the gun under a stone that maybe after the war we will come there and pick it up again. <laughs> and we went over that little bridge and there was a man, a civilian, standing there with a shotgun and then looking down there at the water. And sure enough, he asked me uh, in Hungarian, where do I go? I didn't understand the word of Hungarian. Although later on we, uh, we learned it in, in, 
uh, read and write and speak, you know. And uh, so I told him, I can't, I don't understand. He says, what do you understand? Ukrainian? I say, yes. So he spoke to me, Ukrainian. Where do you go? Or where do you come from? So that peasant that showed us the directions told us to tell him that I am going to buy there. I went there to buy a, a sheep or something like this, you know. He says, all right, come with me. And we took, they took us to the uh, point, you know, to the uh, border point where there were all the soldiers there and officers. And one came out and he spoke to us German and, uh, and right away, uh, who are you, where are you, you know. And I told him, yeah, I'm a dentist, this is my wife, and we came from Poland. And somehow I sensed that uh, he is uh, very sympathetic to our cause, you know, knowing that we are Poles, not Jews, that he didn't know, because we had uh, papers, gen uh, had a paper from a Gentile that was taken out to Siberia by the Russians. And <clears throat> so, uh, they gave us food and they told me, well, you have to go. They gave us a soldier was about this tall, without without a gun, without anything, that he will show us the way to the uh, Chenders, this is the gendarmerie. And uh, that they will attend to us. We came over there, first of all, you know, the buckets. And I was so glad I got rid of that gun. And as they empty my pockets, they found that piece of paper, that certificate that the Hungarian wrote. He wrote it in uh, Hungarian. Mm -hmm. So they knew it couldn't be a phony because we didn't understand the word. And this piece of paper saved us because usually whoever was caught uh, going uh, illegally passing the border, you know, was sent back to Tatarov where that Gestapo uh, post was with the dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, he instead called up the district attorney in the next township, which was Marmor Stigit, and he asked him, look, we caught here a pair, a couple of poles. What should I do with them? And we found in his pocket, you know, this in this certificate that he helped out our 103rd command. He didn't want to take anything from them, and, he, and the uh, lieutenant asked there to give him support. He says, "Don't send them back. Send them over to us here to Marmar Sigit, to jail, of course." So in Mamre Sigi, they, uh, they put us in jail. They took us there, they put us uh, her in a separate cell, me in a separate cell. And from there, the, uh, the judge called me up one day and he asked me, look, I want to ask you a question. Are you Jewish or are you Polish? I told him, you see my papers, I'm Polish, my father was Polish, my uh, grandfather was Polish. He says, because Jews, we have our own, we have enough, plenty of our own, we don't uh, need any from, to import any. But if you are Polish, we have to uh, give you some jail for passing the border illegally. So Wednesday is, it says, or Thursday is going to be your trial here. So if you feel safe here, we can give you two months, three months, four months, you know, as long as you tell us 
But if you want to go out, you know, we'll give you as long as you were here until now. We'll give you that long jail, you know, and you will go free. So we told them, we want, we want to get out. So there was the trial, and they gave us these. And there was one uh, lawyer that attended. He uh, was interested to know that there is a Polish couple. And uh, he got in touch in Budapest with the... Uh, there was an association of the uh, ones that uh, ran away from Poland. You know, and he got in touch with them, and they said that they started uh, steps, you know, to save us. And so, what that lawyer did for us, because it was a marmor secret like this, that when you go out of jail, then they turn you over to the gendarmes again, you know, and. They decide your fate, whether they they want you here. Most of the cases, they sent you back to uh, Poland. So the lawyer did something with the uh, uh, warden, you know, and he let us out a day earlier. So when the gendarmes came the next day for us, we weren't here anymore. We were already on the way to Budapest. How did you make your way there? And how did you know to go to Budapest? Well, we, uh, the lawyer told us that he gave us the address of that uh, Group? of that association, you know. Of the, so we went there to uh, Budapest, and when we came there, they sent us to a camp, which was not a, uh, a uh, labor camp or something like this. It was just a camp where the people from Poland, you know, were sitting there. We were getting uh, every 10 days, you know, some money from London uh, to live on. Mm -hmm. What was life life like there in the camp? Uh, in the camp, fine. It was nice. It was just uh, privately. You rented an apartment uh, somewhere, you know, and you lived there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all the time, still, you know, on the. Uh, uh, aria papers, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to go to church every Sunday, you know, and pray. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then from from there, there there was hell. Then again, when the war started, when the Germans mm -hmm. came mm -hmm. in, so we had to run away from that camp to Budapest again. And there was a group that wanted to go. Uh, meanwhile, my wife was pregnant, you know. And there was a group that wanted to go to uh, to the Carpet uh, Hills, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the mountains there, and to fight the Germans. They were all killed over there. My wife uh, couldn't go there anyway. She felt that she is excluded. You know, she didn't feel well because you had to, uh, you couldn't take a woman there, you know, which is pregnant, you know. And uh, we, uh, we, so we, yeah, in Budapest, I reminded myself of that lieutenant that gave me that certificate. I knew that he worked in a factory of chocolate, the biggest factory of chocolate in Budapest, Stimmer. And I called up that factory and I asked, tell me, do you know of a lieutenant, Bayenschrott? You know, he used to be, he was in the army, but uh, do you know where he is? He says he's right here, and if you want to talk to him, let him let him talk to you. And I came over there to the factory, and he, just like with a brother, embraced me and kissed me, and he didn't know what to do with me. 
And he says, what do you need? You need money, you need... What do you need? I told him, I need nothing. All I need is being that Budapest is being bombed then by by American and English uh, planes, that I need a place to hide. So he told me, wait a minute, I will ask my boss, the owner of the chocolate, uh, factory had a place a hundred kilometers away from Budapest. He says, Go there. I'll give you a letter there. Go there. Of course, you're not going to be a dentist there. But he said, You're going to be a helper to, to a uh, uh, blacksmith, you know, like on a farm. There was a farm, you know, you need horseshoes and this and that. You'll be a helper there, and this way you will be insignificant, you know. Nobody will pay attention to you. It's just one of the people, though, the farm people. So I went over there, you know, and I uh, lived there until, until the... Uh, Liberation. We were liberated then by the Russians. And, uh, well, after the liberation it was a little easier already. I uh, did some dental work already then. Where? In, did you go back in, in that to village. Oh, in, in that village. In mm -hmm. that village I did some dental work, you know, uh, helped out people and uh, and then we went to uh, to Budapest again. I was sitting there until finally we decided to run from Budapest because they closed up the borders. So we ran with a Russian truck all the way to Vienna. Oh, in Vienna already? Uh, Vienna, Vienna already. Well... Oh, I'm sorry. Do you, do you want to backtrack a little? Yeah, I will. Talk a little bit more. Yes. Side. You want to go out and have a cigarette? I can have a cigarette. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are in Vienna. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. I the, don't is know. there something that you want to include from? Yeah. Before that. Okay. I wasn't here all the time. I don't know, but. I, I have a different idea about this taping. My idea is less personal and more of a global feeling about it. So whoever is studying it could understand what it means to cross a border, to live and be ridden with lice and hungry, scratched up, filthy, and then cross a border into Hungary, where the Jews were still walking around, where you could still be a person, not that dog that's being hunted all the time. And I think that's very important. And this is the feeling I had. I couldn't believe that just crossing one narrow street makes a difference between living and, and being alive and being dead. Of course, what happened later in history was that Hitler occupied, my husband probably mentioned, in, in uh, March 19, 1944. Hitler came to Hungary, and that changed the, the whole situation. But in between, it was quite a culture shock for us, because we were already conditioned that we were nothing. We were conditioned that we have no pretense to be human beings anymore. And just to see those people on the way to the prison, we saw Jews in Balashad Yarmouth. And we looked at each other. They are Jews. They wear these uh, furry hats. They were very Hasidic Jews in Balashad Yarmouth in Hungary. We couldn't believe what happened. And you know, of course, that whole strain of uh, acting as Aryans and being Aryans and not slipping that you are Aryans, and all this to live with on a daily basis is a very strenuous, terrible, terrible thing. Um, I don't know if my husband mentioned, but when the 
Germans occupied Hungary. I was already pregnant. I don't know if mm -hmm. you mentioned yes, you that. Did. And when we ran to Budapest, we had no way to go. We used to walk till 11 o'clock at night, and people used to put out signs outside the door that they have a bed, a bed to let. And we used to look at those signs. And March can be a pretty cold month. And the rain was, it was raining heavily. And I didn't get to sleep till about 12 o'clock at night, every night. And naturally, that went on for a while. Then the Allies were, were already very close to Budapest. It was 1944. And we finally found the shelter, but it was on the sixth floor. And every time there was an air uh, raid alarm, no elevator, everybody had to go down six uh, floors. Well, we didn't go down because I was afraid to face the other people. I didn't want questions. I wasn't afraid of the bombs, let's put it this way. We stayed up there all the time. Till finally, also through that miraculous uh, lieutenant, yes. we found ourselves in the country where I gave birth to my son. Uh, the, uh, it was a very uh, difficult moment, too, because the border, the little village, was in between the Russian army and the German army. And we were in the middle, and they were shooting at each other over, uh, over our heads. And I gave birth to the baby in a hospital. The baby had to be baptized, so among the bullets, I went out from door to door to the other end of the village to get a little bit of milk, because my peasant didn't have a cow. Well, finally, the Russians came. And the first thing they did, they were very suspicious of us. How come we survived? How come, since we are not Hungarians, what are we doing here? He spoke fluent Russian. They, they wanted to shoot him as a spy. Well, this went on for a while, and then we decided to go to Budapest. And Budapest it was sort of like a cultural reawakening again. The theaters opened. There was no food. The inflation was so horrific that if you had in the morning several million pangas to go to the market and buy potatoes and carrots, by the time you wanted to go in the afternoon, you did not have enough for a bunch of carrots, literally. Impossible. There was no meat to be obtained. But the theaters were open, the cabarets were open, the movies were open. There was no food. And for us, it was uh, the total liberation. But of course, when you live under the uh, Russians for a while, you start to realize there's no future to it. And then, as my husband mentioned, we decided to cross the Russian sector and go into Vienna, into the American sector. And this is where we went. And I think Vienna <coughs> is a very good time in my life. Perhaps I should have stayed there. <coughs> I couldn't. Because whenever I looked at the German, I thought that each and every one of them is a murderer of my brother, my sister, and my parents, and my grandparents. I spoke German fluently. I couldn't stand the language and the culture and the people. I just could not be there. So we decided to go to the United States. How were you able to come here? Through the highest. Mm -hmm. We went through the highest. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you have any family here? We had family, but no one helped us. So it wasn't close family. They were, you know, cousins, distant mother's cousins. Uh, it was a very difficult beginning, terribly difficult. When I came here, our son was only six years old. Mm -hmm. We did not speak the language at all. We so had that was no in 1950? Money. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was born in 1944, mm -hmm. in the middle of the war. And uh, we didn't know which way to turn, absolutely. It was a culture shock. We couldn't acclimate. We couldn't assimilate. We had no help. And my husband was going from one job to another, from peddling. Couldn't go to a medical school because he had to go during the day. And there was no one to support me and the little boy. So 
It was a very, very difficult situation for many, many years. Uh, I think it took us about 15 years till my husband decided instead of practicing dentistry, he's going to open a dental lab. And once he opened a dental lab and I decided to go back to school, things worked out a little bit better. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you had another child? I had a daughter here. Mm -hmm. When you look back at it, and uh, what are your thoughts? And, um, you know, Just a terrible sadness for the waste, the waste of lives, the waste of hopes. I can't put it as eloquently as Wiesel did yesterday, but I share his feelings. And uh, he said he doesn't feel hate, I do feel hate. He said he lacks that sensation, I do not. I feel tremendous hate towards a nation that created uh, such brilliant people and was able to overlook what was going on because they cannot say that they didn't see and they didn't hear. And all these small towns in Germany, the railroad tracks run in the middle of the towns. And when they saw those wagons packed, and when they saw those people being carried out, they knew what was going on. And Wiesel said he doesn't believe in collective guilt. I do believe in collective guilt. I believe in a permissiveness of a whole society that allowed to eradicate people, that allowed children and babies to be killed. I do believe in, in collective guilt. Of course, guilt. There, there, yes, there, were, there were a few of them, you know, there that, were exceptions. that were a little bit uh, more humane, you know, than the other. But uh, let's say like that uh, officer that came in Warsaw and he told me, you know, run for your life. Some of them. Uh, some of them uh, were pretty decent. And I think what has happened 40 years ago uh, created a, a, an atmosphere where killings and murder is taken as a daily occurrence, where people become totally uh, indifferent to sufferings of other people. And I think it started when Hitler started. Because nobody can understand what it means. Six million, five million, eleven million. What does it mean? It's a number. You see one child kill, you understand it. But the sheer, the, the sheer magnitude of what has happened created an entirely different philosophy of life and death in our times. This is how I feel. And uh, personally, I think that what Hitler planted the seed, you know, right. and other European uh, town, cities and towns, you know, and maybe in, uh, here in the United States too, it took very well, you know, and it's flourishing. You know, so even when we speak about street crime that is so full of st we, we are full of crime here in this country in this city. It means nothing. I uh, don't wanna finish without mentioning something. I don't know if my husband mentioned it. Did you? What? About Jen? No, I didn't. Well, I'd like to if I can. We had our son that was born in Hungary, you know, and uh, we he came here when he was six years old. We did everything we could, you know, to make some something out of him. He became a pharmacist, and uh, he saved up enough money to buy a house and to buy a pharmacy, you know. And uh, one day, just he went home and. Uh, Apparently, people, uh, it seems that maybe people that he knew or he didn't know, but they rang the bell, and as soon as he came in, they pushed him inside. And uh, robbing the house, he was... Uh, they killed him. And they killed him there. And they, it was uh, two and a half years ago. 
Yeah. I wrote a poem and I sent it to newspapers and many of them published it. And because it's tied in with the Holocaust, I'd like to read it. I don't know if I can. That was two years ago. Could you read it for me? I really can. It's tight. All right, I'll read it. Do you want Mr. Shanley to read it? No. Could you read it? <laughs> Will it be on the tape? Okay? You were the title. No, the title is the eulogy. Eulogy to my murdered son, Jan. <laughs> you were the life of my life. You were what's best in me. You were the child of a child struggling through the horror of the Holocaust. In my womb, you felt the pangs of hunger, the Nazi boot and abuse the fear, humiliation, and terror. You are a child of the Holocaust. Across the ocean we sailed to reach the shores of America, to find peace, beauty, and justice, and escape from the demon of Holocaust. But the evil perpetrated by Nazis spans time, oceans, and continents. The human spirit was corrupted and engendered the viciousness of the Holocaust. On the peaceful shores of America, you were murdered in your home. Asphyxiated life, my parent, parents and sister, you are still a victim of the Holocaust. It wasn't the daily news when it happened, because I sent it in. It's all. Part of our life. Mr. Shumley, is there anything that you would like to add? <laughs> I don't know what to add. You know. No, I have nothing to add. Do you have any questions about Germans and things? That's something. That... How have you shared your experience with your daughter? Not in the beginning, because it wasn't the thing to do among our people. But later on, yes, and she seemed to be very involved with it. Of course, she has little children, and she can participate, but she joined the second generation in Jersey. And she begged me many times to put things on tape. I have it on tape, because... You don't have it. We started just uh, doing it on tape. No, honey, you know? I had it done with Levy. I have two two cassettes. Yeah, I, I did know. it in school. Did no, you didn't know about it. And in school, I'm a school librarian. I hope I can go back to my job. I don't know. It's at your junior high school, and they did include a curriculum for one month in social studies on the eighth grade level of the study of the Holocaust. And naturally, being a librarian and a survivor, I always teach for that month. And it's, it's amazing the response I get. And I'm not too pleased with it either. Because it seems when you talk to an eighth grader, and our population in my junior high school is uh, what 25% uh, blacks about 40% Jewish, and the rest Italian, and so on. So it's a mix. It's a very healthy mix. But it seems when you speak about these cruel things, it titillates them rather than evoke pity. And I'm afraid of that. And I drew back, and I didn't talk as much about these horrible things to them. I talked about issues and why it happened. One thing they are all asking me, all the children, now they they are 13, 14, and 15 year old. Why did you allow it to happen? Then I have to backtrack and go down to their level and prepare a scenario where they, you are in Canarsie, the school is in Canarsie in Brooklyn. 
and slowly, slowly, all the vestiges of power, of, of civilization, of being a citizen, are being taken away from you. One day they tell you you're not allowed to vote, the next day they tell you you're not allowed to go out after dark, and the third day they tell you you can't shop in the neighborhood store, and then you can't shop again, go out at all. They reduce you to zero, you know. And this is the only way I was able to explain to the children why we didn't fight back. They couldn't understand it, none of them. That's one thing they couldn't understand. As I said, I stopped including any gory details because I saw that I addressed the darker side of each human being. A lot of us have it. So I stopped that. But uh, I still believe in teaching the Holocaust in junior high school, and in our school we do. We have a very strong uh, faculty and a good principal, and we do it. And I did tape uh, two cassettes. He didn't even hear it, so I have that. But going back to my daughter, she asked me for a video and never got around to it, and now I'll have it for whatever it's worth. Thank you. Thank you. He also comes from...